Norbert. Do you want to applaud? We can do it. Everyone applaud Norbert. Woo! Yes, on your feet. Oh, we're free with love today, aren't we? It's great. This is good. No, we honour you and we love you and we want you just to feel free amongst us as you share God's words to us. Bless you. Hello everyone. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. It's the the most wonderful name ever. No name can match it. He has no rival. He has no competition. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's here right now with us. What a wonderful time we are having. Thank you so much, uh, Jenny. That is a wonderful thing that you are doing. I'm, I'm impressed. I want to be part of it. I know I work Monday to Friday, but I sure can pray. I sure can do something because of the greater calling that is in this. It's more than food distribution. It's the distribution of love. It's the distribution of compassion, of eternal life. And that's what matters. God's perspective. It's not about food. Food is just the beginning. (laughs) There are greater things that are involved. Okay, let's go into today's word. So we are still continuing with uh, disciples making disciples. And, uh, you know, if I should confess, the message that Nathan preached was the message he was supposed to preach. (laughs) On Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. And when he started, when he brought his uh, lamb, I suspected that something was not right. (laughs) And when he started, I said to my daughter, that's that's what I was supposed to. No, what am I going to say? You know, when I'm told that you're going to be speaking, I pray, I do rehearsals in the shower, because normally, for some reason, don't ask me why, God speaks to me when I'm in the shower. <laughs> even mathematical problems at work, I was telling my wife, even when I have problems at work with my formulas, with my Excel, I pray to God, he speaks to me in the shower. Gives me specific instructions. When you get to work, do A, B, C, D. And the answer comes out. So God speaks to me when I'm in the shower. Almost all the time. So I love my shower time. (laughs) So when Nathan preached, I had to go back to God and say, God, I can't preach that. Nathan has already, he spoke about it, you know, it was so amazing. Give me something else. (laughs) And when I was in the shower, God gave me that message. It is inspired by John, apparently, when he spoke about power and authority and um, what power is and what authority is. So the title of the message is, What's in Your Hand? We are approaching Christmas. It's a beautiful time, a busy time, a time to be with family. It's a time when people expect gifts of the flesh, but we want to give them that gift of the spirit, which is very, very important. So we shall go to our scriptures, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1 to 4. So that is the English standard version. Um, if you have your version, you can also read along. And uh, he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every Affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the text collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Tedius, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Verse 8. Heal the sick, raise the dead, Cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. I also had liberty to take a similar scripture in Luke chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, which says, And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God 
end to heal. All right. Now, why I took the liberty of uh, getting the same message from Luke is because Luke says, as a word that Matthew does not use. And Luke as the word power. Luke, Matthew says, he gave them authority, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But Luke says, he gave them power and authority. But those two things are different, but they serve the same purpose. Amen to that. Are we together? I want you to be with me. Okay. Follow me because I'm following Jesus. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Okay. So, this is what we are going to be talking about for a few minutes. And my hope and my prayer, and I'm thankful to God that he's here and his glory has come down, is we want to be empowered. We want to receive this power. Now, Any spoke about it when he said you have a gift in you, which is lying dormant. It's there, but it's not being used. It's like taking your car to a fuel station, put the fuel in the car, fill up the tank, go and park it, and then you go take your bicycle and try to ride into London from Chelsea. It's quite a challenge, isn't it? You, you might try. You might get there, but your feet will be swelling and you will need an ambulance. <laughs> okay. So, I also took the liberty of putting names. Now, I want to confess something. When I was reading the Bible, in the, when I got saved, I used to, and to not like two books in the Bible. The book of Numbers and the book of First Chronicles. Those were the most difficult books to read. Why? They talk about names. It's all about names. And the son of so and so. And the son of so and so. And the tribe of so and so. And there were so many people. And some of them are repetitions. Repetitions. Why am I reading this? Names and names and names. But God taught me something about these names. That's why I took the liberty of adding verses 2 and 3 and 4, which speaks about names. Why? Because God identifies people by their names. God calls people by name. He doesn't generalize. He is a God who calls you Nathan, Jenny, Adrian, Sophie. He calls you by name. The Bible says his names are on, his, on the palm of his hand. When he looks at his palm, he sees your name, Tiffany. He sees your, he sees your name, Janet. So he calls you by name. Why? Because your name is what separates you from the rest of the people. It's your name. Okay? Here in the UK, so where I work, we, I deal with names. More than 6,000 names. And some names are so familiar. I know we have got two staff. They have the first, same first name, same surname, same date of birth. But they are different. So what differs them in the UK is the NI number. So if you want to identify them, you have to identify them by the NI number. But God does not use NI numbers. God uses your name. Because no matter how your name may be similar to others, you are different. And when he calls you, you know very well that he is calling you. Despite the fact that there are five Jennies in here, when he says Jenny, the right Jenny will answer. I love moms. Mummies are so unique in what they do. When babies are playing and the baby cries, it is the mummy with that baby that goes. She knows that's my baby crying. She knows the cry of a baby. Even if the babies are outside, all the other moms will be there. They will relax. They say, no, that's not mine. That's not mine. <laughs> but the right mummy will rise up and go and attend to the crying baby. This is the same with God. He knows us by name. He calls us by name. And when he called these people, he did not randomly call. He did not just pick them up. He picked them up by name. Some of them he gave new names. Simon was called Peter. And I call you Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So God knows you by name. He knows who you are. And so the fact that you are here means God has called you and has designed you. So when God called them, he gave them power and authority. Why? Because one thing that makes a Christian unique is the fact that God has clothed you with himself. You see, the world, you shall see as we go on, maybe if you go to the next slide, so that I read more. 
Because I want to talk for a few minutes and then go and sit down and hope that I'll get a pudding for Christmas. <laughs> now, Jesus did not give us what he did not have. He gave us himself. I'm glad you talked about Jesus coming as a baby, living among us, growing among us, eating the same food that we eat, being clothed with the same clothes that we wore, bathing in the rivers that we bath in, and yet he was the son of God. Now, this is what Peter says to Cornelia's household about Jesus in Acts chapter 10, when he was called to preach to the Gentiles, and he's like, what? No, I can't touch no unclean thing. No, he said, no, don't call anything that I have declared clean and clean. And then the man came to him at Joppa and said, we are looking for you. Our master uh, was told by God to come and look for you so that you come and speak to, you, to us about Jesus. He says this, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God, now this is the source, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and its power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Oh, devil, you're in trouble. For God was with him. Hallelujah. <laughs> so Jesus did not just give his disciples power. Uh -uh. He walked in the same power. You see, it's unlike our governments which give you burdens that they can't carry. They make you pay taxes that they don't pay. <laughs> oh, I'm talking politics now. You're quiet now. You're saying, Please don't go there. <laughs> Jesus gave them what he would do himself. He didn't give them a heart. You know, I, I, I talked last time about the professors that give, or the teachers that give children assignments that they would never do. Of course, they would never do because they already did them. They know the answer to that, isn't it? Jesus would go himself heal the sick, raise the dead, and preach that the kingdom of God is at hand. So he was anointed by God. He was given power to go about doing good. And now he says to his disciples, I'm giving you the same power that I have, the same authority that I have to go. You see, discipleship is not enough without the power of God accompanying it. Paul says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, when I came to you, Corinthians, I determined not to know anything about you, save Jesus and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in much trembling. And my preaching and teaching were not with words of man's wisdom, but were with the demonstration of power, so that your faith would not rely on the wisdom of man, but on the power of God. What I am going out there to show is not my power. Because believe me, my power is powerless. I am showing them the power of the powerful God who never loses. Who even death is afraid of approaching. Death cannot touch him. Death could not hold him. It held him for a few days and it let him go. That's how powerful he is. And so, as we go out, we go out not in our power because our power, like I said, is useless. It doesn't work. You always obviously find someone more powerful than you when you go in your power. But when you go in his power, it has no rival. When you go in his power, it has no competition. When you go in his power, even Simon in the book of Acts wanted to buy the power from Peter because he realized this is not ordinary power. This is not power from the horoscopes. This is not power from the stars. Somebody was asking Joe's birthday is tomorrow and was asking, so what sign is he? I said, we don't do signs, my brother. We don't do stars, my brother. We don't do Aquarius Leo. We don't do that. We do Jesus. <laughs> he was shocked. He said, so are you saying these are demonic? I said, well, you told yourself that. We don't do that. We do Jesus. I do Jesus. <laughs> You're surprised. When our daughters were born, so there's a culture back home where the first child has to be dedicated to the demons that run the family. Oh, of course, they don't call them demons. They say our ancestors. So whenever your wife is pregnant with the first child, when the time comes for her to give birth, she has to go back to her parents. They do a ritual, which involves the killing of a goat, 
and taking the blood, putting it in blood, and the woman has to jump over the blood. Yeah? <laughs> they say if that doesn't happen, she might have complications in giving birth and she will die. And when she dies, the problem is with the son-in-law and you have to pay a penalty for the death of their daughter. And it will be more than you can think or imagine. You are paying for a person. All right? So when my wife was pregnant with the twins and the time approached and uh, my father-in-law was expecting her to come but the son-in-law said no. <laughs> and the daughter said, no way. <laughs> there is no way we are going to get our children into this practice. Our children are dedicated to Jesus, not to this nonsense. It was our mother-in-law who had to come into our house. And she stayed there for three months to make sure the babies are now old enough for us to care for them without needing that extra attention because they were a bit of trouble when they were young. They used to cry a lot. <laughs> Thank God now the crying has been transformed to singing, which is good. Okay. Now, now I'm talking about power. When I was a bit young, we had a woman who experienced the same thing. Her daughter was brought into her house by the son-in-law, they said, she's about to give birth. Culturally, we must give her to you. But she was born again. And I was still in my early 20s. She called me. She said, I don't know what to do. They brought her, they brought a goat. I don't know what they want us to do. I said, bring her to me. They brought the daughter to me. I said, kneel down. She knelt down with a big tummy. I laid my hand on her. I said, in the name of Jesus, you will have a normal birth. You will deliver and this child will be great. Amen. And I said, we have done the ritual. <laughs> and she gave birth without any complications. And the child is now a big boy. He's now in his 20s. So the power that Jesus has given us is above any power that you can think of. The authority. Now, if you go to the next slide, we will talk you know, about power. Now, power like John said, is the ability or capacity to do something or act in a particular way. Power. It is the ability. Okay, I put that car there. That's a police car. <laughs> now, if a, pol if a police officer walks in here, okay? Now, do you mind if I use examples? If this police officer... Come, 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 my daughter. <laughs> if this is a police officer and she walks in here and she says... Please come, Adrian. You are under arrest for a crime A, B, C, T. Now he looks at her and he says she's young, she's innocent, she's smiling and everything else. I can get away with this. No, he cannot. Why? Because she's not coming in her own power. There is power that has been invested in her to pronounce arresting to you. And if you don't comply with that power, then you are in trouble with his majesty. <laughs> Thank you. <We> can see. <laughs> because the power that she has has been given to her by it used to be her majesty. Now it's his majesty, isn't it? Has been given by his majesty. So she's not operating on her own orders. She's operating on orders from above. When we come to a person we, with Jesus, we are not operating from our own sphere. Don't look at me and say, oh, he's dark. Oh, he has got a big tummy. Oh, he has got a blue jumper. He can do nothing. I can do something because the one who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. I am terrible. <laughs> so don't you look at me and think, oh, he's just an ordinary boy with his wife and daughter. What can he do? Oh, I can do worse because of the one who is in me. What I'm doing, I'm challenging you. To say you have got one who is greater in you, who has given you the ability and capacity to do things. The food bank has been given the ability to do more than food, to bring people to Christ. And as you work towards that, it's not your own heart. It's Christ who has given you the heart. Follow it, because it will lead many to him. I hope you get what I'm saying. As you do what you do, the abilities in you. Now, this is Matt's guitar. 
He likes his guitar. But as it is sitting there, it is doing nothing. But in the right hands, it produces sound. And let me tell you, if the person who is producing sound is not saved, that sound means nothing. But if Matt is playing it, and he sings a song, and the angels in heaven respond, the ability has been put to good use. I hope you understand what I'm saying. English is not my first language, forgive me. <laughs> the microphone in the right mouth speaks volumes. When you say, oh, Jesus saved me using this, it's different from somebody who says physics works. Because when you say physics works, you say, yeah, so what? I didn't do physics at school. I don't care. But if somebody holds the mic and says, Jesus saves, demons tremble. Well, you may not see it with your eyes, but those with the demons know that something is happening here. The name of Jesus is the most powerful name ever. No president's name can fit. No celebrity name can fit in. This name is above all names. And when it is spoken, demons tremble. We were talking last week uh, upstairs when we were having the discipleship session. They are so, I've been ignited, reignited by that man, you know, Simon, as he speaks. He has reignited me. And we were talking and they were asking us, have you ever had experiences with demons? I said, I had plenty. I actually have a scar from one who was possessed by a demon, which didn't want to go, and she beat my thumb as I was casting the demon out. And I said, when, when I was young, and I'm praying now that it happens here in the UK, in the name of Jesus, and it's going to happen. When I was young, people used to fall in the streets when I was walking. Demons would manifest in streets. We were about a group of four, five, sometimes seven boys. But as I grew up, I realized that God was working in me and I didn't know. Demons would fall in the streets. We would be walking and the person is going by and suddenly the person is down. And she's going like this. And we had to go there and say, in the name of Jesus, out! <laughs> and people would gather and say, what are you doing? I say, keep away. We are introducing Jesus here. <laughs> and I remember distinctly one day we were walking, there was this man who was like that man who used to sit by the tombs in the Bible. He used to carry a lot of metal, you know, metal rods, and he was very violent. So people were afraid of him. So one day we are walking, it's about the seven of us, and I'm on, the, on this side of the road, and the other guys, we were walking along the road, like High Street. And this guy was coming in the opposite direction, and he was walking on the other side. I was right directly opposite him. All of a sudden, I realized I was now the one who was facing him. All these boys had moved. <laughs> they all had moved. I don't know how they moved, how fast they moved, but I realized I was the one who was facing him. And as he was coming, he, was up, he used to approach you at an intimidating speed. And he approached me, and everyone froze. I did not. It was too late to freeze. You know, there's, there are times when it's too late to react. I did not react. I couldn't react. And then he says to me, good evening, sir. And I say to him, good evening, how are you? He says, I'm fine. And then he passed through. And then these boys looked at me and said, what just happened here? And I say to them, Jesus happened. It's not me. He saw something that is greater than I. If he had seen me, he would have used one of his rods. But he saw greater than I. Who is in you? So there is a greater than who is in you. The reason why your workmates despise you is not because of you. It's because they see the greater in you. The reason why people want to spend time with you is not because of you. It's because they see a greater than who is in you. The reason why job opportunities open for you is not because of you. It's because of him who is occupying your heart. So power is the ability. Now, the, the next one. As authority. Authority is the permission to give orders or make decisions and on face obedience. Now, I put a picture of an ambulance there because if you are driving and you see those people behind you with their lights on and their siren on, you make way. All they are basically saying is we have permission to go on. Step aside. We are moving on. <laughs> I hope you understand this. So, when you are in Christ, you have authority for demons and the people who think they know it all to step aside so that you move on. 
God has equipped you with that authority. So Jesus gave them authority. Because when you're dealing with sickness, you need authority. You need power. You need authority. When you're dealing with a person going through a divorce, you need authority. You don't need to read the, the civil acts law. Oh, when you're getting divorced, you get half of it, you know. So don't worry. At the end of the day, you also be rich. It's not about being rich. It's about being rich in Christ. You have authority to, for people to make way so that you pass through. You have authority to speak into the lives of people and proclaim what their lives should be. In other words, if a person is miserable, you can speak to the person and say, I speak joy to you. May you be filled with joy. May you be filled with laughter. May you be filled with love and compassion. May a song fill your heart. The authority is in you. The fact that you are not using it does not mean it's not there. It is there. It just needs you to tap into it. And you will see what God will do. So that's permission. Let me run down and finish. Otherwise, I, I will not finish. And you hate me. Now, an example of authority is this guy. Now, this is not the exact guy. I just put this guy because of what he's holding. What's in your hand? What's in your hand? Now, we, we see Moses. He's being sent. Now, Moses was a murderer. Okay? He ran away from Egypt because he murdered an Egyptian. I don't know how long he thought he could made the Egyptians one by one until Israel was free. It only happens in movies. When it's Rambo or Arnold Schwarzenegger. One man against a thousand soldiers. But you can't do that in real life. And guess what? He was noticed even when he killed one. He was noticed that you did something. So you want to do the same thing here? And he fled and went to Midian. And it is in Midian, 40 years later, Matt preached about this. That he came, he saw a burning bush. And he went to see what's happening. This bush is burning, but it's not being consumed. And he heard a voice. And the, guess what? The voice called him by name. It did not say, oh, who are you over there? God is not blind. He knows you. Moses, Moses. And he knew straight away, this is the Lord. You know, when God calls you, it doesn't matter. You know it's him. You will know. He enables you to identify that now it's me calling you. And God says, go and to back to Egypt, rescue my people. He says, but they will not believe me or listen to my voice for they'll say, the Lord did not appear to you. Then God says, what is that in your hand? It's not like God did not know. But he wanted Moses to confirm what he was holding. He says, a staff. And then God says, throw it down. He threw the staff down. And you know what happened? It's written there. It turned into a snake. And Moses ran away from it. But God said, go and grab it by the tail. He grabbed it by the tail and it turned back into a staff. He says, now, he, there's also something that he says, put your hand in your coat. And the hand came out and it was leprous. And he said, go and show these signs. Now, I want, I'm talking about power. and authority. Now, this was just a staff in the hand of a shepherd. But God used that staff to redeem his people Israel. Now, if you read your book, you will hear that he went to Pharaoh and he threw his staff down and it became a snake. And the worldly official said, <laughs> we can do that. We can all do that. They threw their staff down with their magic and whatever. And they became snakes. And God said, that was just step one. Step two. Moses' staff ate all the other staffs. Now, I want you to listen to me. <laughs> the power that God is put in you is able to eat up all the power of the world. It doesn't matter who holds what. It doesn't matter what they are called, whether they have been, you know, I don't know what you do here where they go down, kneel down, and they receive knighthood with a sword on their sides, and they are, now you are called to say. It doesn't matter they are called to say. There is no say that is greater than say Jesus. And so when you are empowered by Jesus, you can go to say whatever and say, the power that I have is greater than your power. You want the same power? Come to Jesus. Those magicians went home without their staffs. And a staff was a sign of respect and honor and authority. They went home without their authority. I'm sure they waited until it was dark to go home because it was embarrassing that their staffs were eaten by a staff. And not only that, this is the staff that God, it, it changed. It was now called the staff of God. 
not of Moses. Because God would say, go and strike the waters of the Nile and they'll become blood. Go and strike this and lightning will come. Go and point your staff in the air and I will send frogs into the households of Israel. And he pointed his staff at the Red Sea and the Red Sea was split into two. It was just a staff. But God used that staff to save Israel and to kill the Egyptians. This time it was not Moses who killed them. It's God who killed them himself. He just says, just point your staff and the waters will close. And they were closed into the waters. And God had the liberty of sending their bodies out of the water to cleanse the Red Sea of the Egyptians. And the Bible says their bodies lay by the sand. They did not lie in the water. They lay by the sand. God has given us authority. Now we, we don't need staffs. Now, back in my country, there are churches that normally, that usually walk with staffs. When you see the man, every man is required to have a staff as a sign of authority. We don't need staffs. We need Jesus in us. That's the authority that we need. That's more than enough. If you go to the next slide, <laughs> that's more than enough. We need Jesus. Now, those people <laughs> who are to your right, God appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at a table and he rebuked them. Now, this is one thing I'm going to address before I sit down. For their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world. Now, we are talking to those people on the right. <laughs> go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believed and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. All these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. In my name, in my staff. In my name. If you want, you can put your, the staff there. You can imagine a person holding your staff. The name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, you will cast out devils. They will speak in new tongues. We had a beautiful time of speaking in the spirit this morning. Wonderful. For those who have not yet spoken in tongues, it is possible. God can do it. It's possible. Just open your heart to him. I opened my heart and he filled me. And boy, it was great. And it is always great. Even when I'm praying alone and I start speaking that language, it is always a great relief. It's better than drinking glasses of water. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. You don't know how many times they've drunk poison. For some of you, including myself, I ended up with a, a law that I put in my life to say, when I visit, I don't normally eat or drink. I disciplined myself. I said, I'll walk with my own water. I'll walk with my own stuff. Well, back home, it's, even Christians can poison you. Back home. I'm telling you, if they feel so jealous of you, they, they will do anything. I can give you names of preachers who have literally died from poisoning during church functions. Oh, yeah. But the devil is a liar. So if, you, if they drink any deadly poison, they will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. I'm telling you, it's so easy for us when somebody falls sick to say, did you book an appointment with the GP? Did you, did you book, did you go to St. Peter's? Did you go to Ashford? She went to Ashford last weekend. She was there for more than four hours, just waiting to be seen. Four hours. But Jesus is half a minute away. If somebody is sick, if you lay your hand on the sick person, the Bible says, if you believe. Now, if you go to the next slide, because I want to finish, otherwise I will never preach here again. They'll say, this guy takes time. <laughs> The major stop, showstopper to discipleship with signs and wonders is unbelief or doubt. When you are not sure of yourself, even when you go for an interview, let me tell you, those people that are interviewing you are so clever. They are not, they are not listening to what you are saying. They are looking at your expressions. Your expressions will tell them whether you are confident or not. You know, there are people who have mannerisms that when somebody is lying, they do this. There are people who know that if you are talking to someone and is doing this, that person is lying to you. So the person is scratching here, but this is where the brain is stimulating the brain to say, give me more, give me more, give me more, give me more. I got to escape this. <laughs> so when you go for an interview, what happens is <laughs> when, you are, when you are answering questions as they ask you, they are looking at your expression. They are looking at how you move your hands. They are looking at how you're sitting. When you start adjusting your position like this, they know something is up. Something is up, okay? Something is up. So unbelief is like that. When you don't believe, 
you don't get results. It is as simple as that. When you don't believe, nothing happens. Or something bad happens. Now, in the Garden of Eden, I want to tell you this. Maybe you have not heard it. Maybe you have heard it. The sin that Adam and Eve did was not disobedience. It was unbelief. Do you know why I say it was unbelief? Because God told them not to do it. And they did it. That's unbelief. What they're basically saying is, I don't believe you told me this. Okay? I don't believe it. I think I was dreaming or something. He did not say. And then God came down in the garden and says, man, where are you? And man was hiding because man suddenly realized, we are naked. We are naked. We cannot be seen by God. Okay. So, unbelief. If you go down, right. Now, that's a wave. Now, Jesus says, if, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will on, not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but you will say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if. Now, he did not say when. He says if. If is conditional. If you have faith, you will receive. But let him ask in faith without, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that you will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man. Unstable in all his ways. As I finish this morning, I just want to encourage you and to tell you that you have power and authority that you have received. Ability to do stuff. You have the permission to do stuff. But do not allow doubt. Do not allow the question that says, can I really do it? Is it? Do I qualify? You don't need a degree to qualify to do what God says. You don't need a diploma. You don't need a master's. You need Jesus in your life. You just need to believe and to say to yourself, I can do it. And go out there. If you hear somebody sick, say, God, I will do it. I'll go and pray. My motto is, if I pray for someone who is sick and doesn't get well, it's God's fault, it's not mine. I, told, I said, God, it's your fault. I'm not going to be embarrassed on your behalf. Because I'm your vessel, I'm just going to pray. If the person does not get well, and believe me, I have prayed for so many sick people, God has healed them. I have seen people being healed, and I want to see it happening here as well. It is possible. People can be healed. Joe had a cough the other night. He couldn't sleep. He, would, he was coughing continuously. He was, and, and, and my wife was like, I don't know what to do anymore. Please come. Because I, he, I said, okay, you can sleep with him. I'll sleep, I'll sleep somewhere else. And, and I had to go in the middle of the night. I went there and I laid my hand on him. I said, Father, please don't embarrass me. Heal this child. <laughs> this is exactly what I said. I said, don't embarrass me. Heal this child. For the sake of peace, please heal this child. I went and I slept in the other room. And in the morning at 6 o'clock, the girl said, Joe slept late. I said, he's going to school. Wake him up. He's going to school. He woke up. And the first thing he said to his sisters was, Jesus has healed me. Amen. That was two weeks ago. I'm not talking of something that happened. That was two weeks ago. He says, Jesus has healed me. What I'm saying is, if you don't doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave that is carried by any kind of wind. When you read on Twitter that this is happening, you get carried away. When you go on Netflix, you get carried away. When you go on Prime Video, you get carried away. But if you don't doubt, you can say to this mountain, and I want you to say to mountains this Christmas, be removed. I want you to say to your relatives and friends this Christmas, may you be saved in the name of Jesus. Because time is now. I want you to go to those sick people and say, be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed. Don't, don't seek permission from anyone. You have the permission already. God has ordained you. Just go and do it. Just go and do it. Just go and do it. I sound like a madman. But go and do it. <laughs> I'm calling Matt and his team now <laughs> to come back and sing a song as we end this. Go and do it. Be like a mad person. Let people give you names, but go and do it. Because as long as Jesus is in you, he's never going to put you to shame. You will certainly do it. In the name of Jesus. I'm leaving this to Matt.